Thank you, Paul. And sorry for the inconvenience, uh, inconvenient spam messages. Um, so welcome to the, is it the fourth community call already? I believe so. I, we have the two, I think, very, very interesting uh, presentations today. So I, I think I will keep this, the status update uh, relatively short in order to, um, for the call to be, um, to remain um, below one hour to, of duration. We already wasted about 10 minutes on, on spammers. So let's see what we can go through this status update relatively quickly. So the first thing I think is interesting um, that is happening in GU is uh, there's a, there's some new graphical work being done, but I think that Victor will be uh, doing a lot more um, explain about that a lot more in his pre presentation. So what I would like to focus on is the um, the the issue number one four six, which is about the complex script. Uh, I think I can paste it here. So this is about the the complex scripts such as Arabic and Hindu and uh, all this, the, the, the languages and scripts that are rendered either from right to left or have some sort of special handling in order to be um, to convert runes and glyphs into, uh, into actual present, uh, presentable text. And I don't know much about that other than there is a very popular open source library called Halfbus, which is written in C++, that is the one that you're using if you are an open source project. So Chrome uses that. and. I guess Firefox and all the other major uh, programs that need to display arbitrary text in an arbitrary languages, they use this, this library to shape text. So they take as input um, uh, Unicode text as, say, bytes or whatever you're getting, and then a font, I think, and a language and some other parameters. And then they can, out, they can output the shapes, the, the um, um, the, actually, the clip path, it would be in, in GU parlance so that you can render the text on the screen. So this is a difficult problem to solve in GU because I would like to keep the dependencies very few and small and easy to build and so on. So issue number 146 is um, a GU user going through all the, um, doing the research in this library and going through the possible avenues that we couldn't that we could explore uh, in order to gain this feature of, of actually being able to render anything else than Latin text. Um, so this person actually already implemented another feature. It's issue number 104, which is simply, um, which is a prerequisite for this support for broad um, Unicode ranges so that you can actually blend, you can take multiple funds with non-overlapping glyphs. So if you have one font with all the Latin characters, uh, glyphs in it, and you have another font with all the, say, the Arabic or Hindu characters, you can now blend these in, a connect, in, a, in, a, in one collection and use that to draw on your screen. So that's a prerequisite for all this work. So, and I think he also has an example. Here, you can see some examples of mixing different fonts and, and, and in various languages. So I think, that, I think that's a very interesting and promising development because at some point, I've been ignoring it up until now, but I think at some point, she will have to be rendering other um, text other than the Western languages. And um, yeah, so one of 146 is, is definitely a step in that direction. So what next? There, there was work by Rene Post um, I will post paste the link here for converting the icons, the icon VG uh, icons into something that is hardware accelerated on GU. So up until now, and still is, uh, GU takes the icon VG icons and converts them to images each each time you need to have an icon shown on uh, on screen. So the IVG project is uh, is going towards what I think is the correct way to do it is to um, express these icons as clip paths and, and drawing operations into you so that they will become, um, uh, so that you don't have to have an, an intermediary picture or image just for it to be rendered at some size. And then whenever you resize the icon or you change your, 
monitor display uh, resolution, you have to redo all that uh, from from uh, from scratch. So that's the IVG project. Um, let's see if I have anything else. Oh, it's a little thing. There's finally a loader. I needed it for just the standard inter uh, indeterminate loader. I needed it for some loading animation for the tail scale project. So that's been implemented. If you need that, uh, right? I think that's about it. So let's um, pass it on to to Chris, if you like. Sure thing. Okay. Is that everything? Everything? Yes. All right. Can okay, yeah. You know, joining with two computers, you can see your own sharing. You can know it works. Very convenient. All right. So hey everybody, I'm Chris. Um and I want to talk about four different projects uh today, but I'll try and be brief on all of them. Um real quick, this isn't related to my day job. Um, all of this work is done in my free time, and anything I say doesn't relate to my work. Uh, so first off, uh, I've been developing a library of material design components. Um, the Geo core libraries are providing buttons and labels and uh, a lot of useful primitives, but for laying out, you know, like a conventional mobile application, we need more than that. We need application bars and navigation drawers and uh, contextual menus and a lot of things. In fact, there is, there's a list of the things that we're probably going to want uh, available on the material design website. And my eventual goal is to build most or, or all of these uh, for Geo. But right now, I, uh, I've been able to implement a top app bar, um, which isn't that different from a bottom app bar, but there's a few things that we need to change to support that, and a modal navigation drawer, which is down here. So there's, there's quite a few that still need some work. Um, it's available in this source hut repository. It's license compatible with Geo core. Um, and so in the future, if we collectively decided that some parts of this belonged there, it would be easy to move them. And I have a demo application uh, to show you what these things are like. So here is a, a simple Geo app with a top bar, a top app bar. Uh, the app bar itself has, as one of its core components, a, a navigation button. Uh, in this implementation, that navigation button has a customizable icon, which if you don't provide, this space will kind of collapse and the title will align over here. And there's a set of actions that you can provide. And these actions are represented by some icon. So we can wire up uh, conventional widget.clickable handlers to these. And there's an overflow menu over here that animates in. Uh, so we can provide additional options here. Uh, underneath this overflow menu, there's actually a translucent scrim. It might be really hard to see, but the area out here got a little bit darker. Uh, and if we click out here, it'll dismiss it. Uh, additionally, these buttons collapse when the layout starts to run out of space. Since home is a really short word, this is going to take some uh, fairly dramatic screen dimensions. Uh, but there we go. Um, so they collapse into this menu. Now, that's a problem. But you know, it's new. Bugs are inevitable. Um, I know how to fix that, actually. But uh, I've, I've tried to animate the operations that 
makes sense to do so and that the material design specification uh, recommends. Uh, additionally, I've been able to implement contextual app bars. So uh, often used when you like long press on an object in a mobile UI, you summon a, a new state for the top bar with a button that you can use to dismiss it with a new contextual title for whatever operation you're trying to perform, uh, and with a different set of actions and overflow icons. And so that is implemented. Uh, the animations over here are the same, and we can dismiss it either by using that or by you know, any other widget can also request that it be dismissed. Uh, additionally, I've been able to implement the navigation drawer. So it's a modal navigation drawer because it slides in and covers the existing UI. Uh, again, there's a translucent scrim in the space over here, so we can interact over here to dismiss it. We can also drag it shut on uh, devices that support touch, or I guess you, know, you can do it with a mouse, but it's really unnatural. <laughs> um, it supports hover state animations on the different navigation targets, a customizable title and subtitle, navigation locations with icons or without. And if you don't specify icons, they'll all be aligned where the icons are right now. Uh, material design says not to mix with and without icons in the same menu. And so with this API, if you do that, it's going to look terrible because the the text will be over here for ones without icons and over here for ones with. Um, and additionally, this, this actually does something. You know, we can move to different logical views within our application uh, by changing the navigation targets. And you'll see that there's different actions available within the app bar. Um, so that's what's implemented in materials so far. Um, it does not have an especially stable API because I think it's going to take some more work and some more experience to come up with what we think the real immediate mode incarnation of these components ought to look like. Um, but you know, I, I am using these, and they're they're serving me pretty well so far. I think. Uh, I'm, I'm excited about the future of them and of this library. And so I'm happy to take uh, feedback on their current implementation or talk about how to build new ones or uh, collaborate with anyone who's interested. Um, also, this is the first time I've written any animation code. And so for those of you who that is old hat, uh, I'd probably benefit from, from a glance through the code if you end up having time. Next library. Uh, I've been working on a companion library for Geo called Neotify. Uh, it is intended to provide cross-platform notifications for every platform that Geo itself targets. Uh, it currently supports Android and Linux and BSD, basically anything that uses Dbus to send freedesktop.org specified desktop notifications. And thanks to Greg Pomerantz, uh, Mac OS is it's like mostly there, uh, but that support is not in the primary branch. I would really love help with Windows and WebAssembly. Uh, those are both really alien worlds for me, and I don't even have a Windows computer. Um, so if anyone is interested in, in rolling that out, uh, or just giving me advice on how to roll that out. I would love to talk to you. Uh, I want to be really clear that these are not currently push notifications. These are notifications being sent by a running application from the background. But if the app isn't running, this doesn't work, doesn't do anything. Um, but it's been like good enough in, in like an Android app. If the app is running in the background, it can still you know, push these to, to me in the foreground in the way that I want. Um, 
Again, this is hosted on SourceHut and is license compatible with the main Geo repository. Haptic is a tiny, tiny little library for haptic feedback. And it only does Android right now, but I'm hoping to add iOS as a backend with the same API. Um, so it just lets you send little haptic buzzes on the device. Um, it's, it's super simple, but it exists. Thought I'd mention it. Uh, you can find it in the same place, and it has the same license. So now the big one. Um, Arbor is a unrelated project that I've been working on for the last two and a half years in various uh, incarnations. Uh, essentially, it is a chat, like a real-time chat platform implemented where chat is a tree instead of a linear sequence of messages. Um, so if we were to look at an example, uh, if let's say you're in Slack and you have a dedicated channel for code review, so some developer asks for eyes on their pull request. I apologize, I need to. And their various teammates um, ask some questions. Um, but if, if you read through this in order from top to bottom, let's say this is occurring in a Slack thread, this conversation is a little bit incoherent. And the reason it's incoherent uh, is that some of these replies are to messages that are not the message immediately above them. And I think that, at least for me, and I suspect um, for most people, when you when you have to parse a conversation like this in your head, you have to essentially read a message, realize it doesn't make sense as a response to the message right above it, and then backtrack until it does. So you're building a tree already in your head in order to read this. And Arbor is a project that tries to capture this information for you so that you don't have to do that. It's a free and libre and open source software project built on open standards and specifications designed to support a variety of deployment models, including decentralized use cases. Uh, so that most constraints are enforced through cryptography rather than through like a conventional permissions system. And its kind of target use case is open collaborations such as open source software communities. Um, the reason I'm talking about it is because our primary interface for Arbor is now built using Geo, and it, it's the motivating thing that's been driving all of these other libraries that we've talked about. Uh, so I will show you that in a minute, but I want to give you a quick orientation through what is actually happening in Arbor's kind of backend data model uh, so that you, you know what you're looking at. Arbor represents conversations as a data structure calls the forest. Um, this is a Merkle forest, so it's a bunch of different trees where every node in the tree refers to every other node by a cryptographic hash of that node's content. There are three kinds of node. There are identity nodes, which are just a user account. It's, it's a username bound to a public key. There are communities, which are analogous to like a Slack workspace. So it's a named place for a community of people to communicate. Um, there's only one that we're really using in actual Arbor right now for Arbor development, um, but we can we can make more. Um, and then there are replies. A reply is is the the meat and potatoes of Arbor. It is the message from a user to the rest of their community, uh, and you either reply and, and the parent of a reply node is either a community or another reply. So replies are what actually forms most of a tree. Um, every message is signed by some identity node, the identity node that created it. And as I said, because it is a uh, Merkle data structure, every reference between the nodes is a hash. 
the reason it's a Merkle tree is that you can actually acquire the data of Arbor history from any source, including untrusted sources. And like, like cloning a signed Git repository where you've got like signed tags or signed commits, you can, if you have the public key of the signer, you can validate the entire structure uh, by checking those hashes and those signatures. So we can do some really cool decentralized things because the chat history can be validated largely in isolation. Um, and it enables us to do some cool offline first things. So what does this look like? So here is Sprig, which is our primary interface for Arbor. We run this on all of the desktop platforms that Gia supports and, and the mobile ones. Uh, the only place we're not really using this is in WebAssembly. Um, and I've moved my configuration to a new folder. So this is like starting it for the first time. Um, so first, you're warned that because of the properties of this chat, like messages are immutable and effectively public. Um, and so you need to understand that before you participate. Then you're asked for the address of a relay server to connect to. And the one that we use for development is arbor.chat port 7117. So we can connect to that. We then need to supply a, a name for our identity. So we'll do that. And in the background, while we were creating our identity, it downloaded this history from uh, the, the relay that we connected to. Um, and there's, there's quite a bit of it. There's many, many thousands of messages here. Um, from the Arbor development community. So it looks at first like any other chat, you know, it's, it's a linear sequence of messages. But if we select a message, uh, Arbor will give us some hints about where it is within its hierarchy. So this message that we've selected is a response to the message immediately above it. And the message immediately below it is a response to it. That's actually a very short tree, I wonder. All right, yeah, so here, uh, this message uh, is discussing the animation <laughs> timings within some of the material components we were just looking at. Um, but the conversation it's part of disappears off screen. So one cool thing that Arbor can do is it can actually filter out all of the messages in between messages that are relevant to this conversation, because we know which messages are responses to what. Uh, so we can condense that and, and read through this and understand it, and then return to a global view of every message through time. Uh, to respond to messages, you can either use the reply button that's spawned when you select a message, or there's also one in the contextual bar. And responding gives you a response preview. Uh, you can so dismiss the response editor. Um, because Geo doesn't quite do like native system clipboard stuff using, or at least I haven't implemented binding like control V and, and things like that. Uh, there's buttons for pasting into the editor and for copying messages that are selected. Um, but if you don't want to respond to a message, but you instead would like to create an entirely new conversation, that's what uh, this plus button here is for. So we can say, I have no idea whether anyone will be around to see that. But here it is. It exists. Um, additionally, we're taking advantage of the navigation drawer. Uh, so there's 
some different settings we can customize information about our identity uh, the relay we're connected to you can globally enable notifications um, you can also enable like the geographics profiling operations uh, up there at the top and something that is a little weird and not very pretty you can live edit the uh, the material design theme that you're using, so we can redefine, you know, any any of the colors uh, that we want within the UI, and even uh, down below we can remap which one is used where. Uh, it, I don't think those widgets are especially pretty. I intend to to circle back on those, but. Uh, that's where we are right now. Um, let's see. And hey, one of our community members is around. So yeah, uh, that is Sprig, our reference uh, client in a nutshell. So the Arbor project is two specifications right now. It's a data structure for representing chat this way and a protocol for exchanging updates to that. Um, there's implementations in Go. Uh, there's a relay you know, server implementation. We have a terminal UI client, um, but most of development effort is going into Sprig, the Geo-based client you just saw. And in the near term, uh, we're going to try and get Sprig into F-Droid and test flight. Uh, we're going to be building out more material design components uh, that will land in materials uh, to improve the experience of using Sprig. Uh, we're going to try and push Neotify to support more of the notification platforms uh, so that the entire Arbor community can get to stop notifications. And we're going to be working on enabling uh, like real status information, such and such users online etc. Uh, if you're interested in helping with any of these libraries or with Arbor, um, you can contribute in, in the normal ways. You can contribute code, bug fixes. Uh, right now, they're set up to use my public inbox mailing list on Source Hut. But if like demand warrants it, I, I'd be happy to create a project and an issue tracker and a dedicated mailing list. It, kind of depends on how much traffic there is. Um, you're welcome to join Arbor and introduce yourself. We actually have uh, pre-built binary uh, builds that you can grab right off of our source set page and, and run. And you know because it's Geo and, and Go, they just they have no dependencies. They just go. It's, it's awesome. And if you want, uh, I'm available to sponsor on GitHub or Libra Pay. All of this work is in my free time. Um, and that would help a lot with some of the costs, especially associated with running Arbor. Um, so yeah, um, if we have time, I can take some questions. I think we should um, take the questions after Victor's presentation. OK, sounds We are sounds running good. sort of out of time. That's so if fine. everyone can remember the questions they have for Chris, thank you very much, Chris. That was very, very impressive. Um, let's take them after Victor's presentation. Great. So Victor, are we, you ready? I think so, if you can, can hear me. Yes, I can. All right, let's see if I can share my screen, entire screen. Uh, share, is that visible? You guys seeing my screen? Yes, it is. Perfect. All right. So I'll try to be relatively quick then. Uh, so short recap of uh, of the rendering in, uh, however you wanted to pronounce it, Geo, uh, as as is, and uh, what I together with uh, with you uh, are investigating. So first, shortly, who am I? My name is Victor, and uh, also what I do here is spare time and my time and nothing to do with my employment. Uh, I've been doing Go for a long time since well before 1.0 and I I mean my, my interest in programming is tends to be going quite quite low level into the details. 
um, and I've yet to actually use Q for something proper. Uh, that was the plan initially, and then I, I was missing the fine transformations uh, that I wanted, and I ended up working working on that instead of, of doing what I initially set out to, to build. So we'll see what I, when I get, get around to that. All right. So this might be old news to many of you. If so, please stop me, but I'll try to go quite quickly through it. Uh, so the rendering pipeline in GU as it looks today uh, from a high level perspective is that everything that the user does or anything that you do in, for example, the material components, etc., go through the opt-out clip and opt-out paint pack uh, packages. Um, so that goes for text, it goes for UI elements, drawing element, uh, drawing images, whatnot. All of that goes goes through the same packages, and they in turn encode uh, the data um, uh, in a byte stream as encoded uh, quadratic Bezier curves. Uh, and that has really, I think, that has turned out to be a very very smart design choice. Um, because it, it's made it extremely easy for me to, to dig into the code and, and add stuff on the back end, and it will make it very simple to, to swap out the, the back end. So, so as a contributor, I, I think that that has been a very wise uh, choice uh, when you set up the project. Uh, those, uh, that encoded data structure is then rendered by the GPU package, uh, which is enabled by several different, different backends. Today, all of them running on fixed pipeline setups, uh, OpenGL, DirectX, et cetera, uh, but using the fixed pipelines, uh, which we'll get back to um, in a minute. One important part to note here is that this encoded structure uh, have what, uh, what is what's called macros um, in the, in the uh, clip paint package. Uh, and they have identities allowing us in the in the background and in the GPU package to do caching. And uh, I think again will be will be important going forward. So uh, fine transformations, which I worked on a month ago basically, uh, and just again quickly running through what it meant to add it because I, I find that experience to be uh, fun and uh, very approachable. Again, coming back to, to the structure. So before uh, we started work on the fine transformations, the any drawing paths you make, they supported offsets. And the rendering backend, the GPU backend, actually depends on complex curves being split into simpler paths, such that they never cross a vertical line more than once. Meaning that, for example, if you draw half a circle uh, from uh, from minus ninety degrees to plus ninety degrees, um, that would be or, or an S or something. It, it would be split anyway. Uh, the The challenge that I encountered was that when we allow for arbitrary uh, fine transformations, that means rotations and skews, that will actually alter what lines are vertical and what lines are not vertical. Uh, as the GPU sees them, meaning that a lot of that work had to be moved from the, I call them front-end packages, but from the clipping package to the GPU package. And that meant that they were no longer recorded uh, in the macros and they were no longer being cached. So there was, initially there was a huge uh, performance hit uh, when adding uh, the um, fine transformations that fortunately not enough, Elias caught uh, and subsequently helped me to to, to fix, so that's that's fixed now. Um, yeah, implementing the support in the back end, uh, which I will quickly show how we do that today because it works well, it's simple, but it, it definitely opens up, up for better optimizations uh, in the future. So in GU today, when you render a clipping path, for example, the, the top left triangle, that will go through several uh, passes but one of them being to 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 draw this into a stenciling um, texture that will or buffer will that will later be used for drawing and that's simple enough uh, to to lay out sorry let, let me start again so what what you does is that for every shape that you want to draw 
a rectangular bounding box is generated and those rectangular bounding boxes are placed in the texture uh, to, to fit as snugly as possible, but there will obviously be some ways in space, in particular if you have, uh, for example, lines or uh, outlines that are empty in the middle, you will have a lot of wasted space uh, in, the, in your texture. For fine transformations, in order to reach, uh, for now, uh, sufficient performance, what I do is that I actually transform the bounding box separately from the shape. And for simple shapes, such as the triangular uh, triangle, that works fine. That means that you will get a bounding box in your texture that looks the same as if you were drawing the, the rotated triangle uh, originally. Whereas if you, for example, have a circle that obviously, if you rotate it, will not uh, will not get a different bounding box. That will actually get a bigger, a bigger bounding box. The the way we we implement the fine transformations now. So that's just a slight warning. If you do arbitrary transforms such as rotation and skews, be aware that you might actually be be wasting even more um, buffer space. As before, pure uh, offsets or transformations that are just offsets they are being cached. There's no need to redraw the, the stenciling shape um, from one frame to the other if you just offset it. Um, so that will be reused and that will be fast. Whereas if you want to do animations with other types of transforms, scaling, rotation, or skews, the entire pipeline will have to be run through and you will see uh, yeah, lower FPS basically. I would like to, to see if we could, could catch that going forward, but, but I haven't really been able to figure out any good reasonable way to do that since if we, for example, um, rotate or let's say scale, it's easier. If we, if we scale by a factor two and we use the old uh, stenciling frame, we will be getting pixel artifacts. But if, if anyone has any, any good suggestions or ideas here, that's uh, highly appreciated. And finally, the, the use of facing API was, was landed and, and published uh, to GU. Uh, and the funny story being that that's where I started. Uh, initially, before looking into this, I, I thought the work was more or less uh, done by, by implementing the, the fine transformations um, in, the, in the clip package. Turned out not to be the case. Um, but I think we, we landed an API that is, is simple enough for, for everyone to use. So throughout this work, big thanks to you, Elias. You've been um, very good in helping someone new in the project to, to get started and get set up. Right. Um, that's basically what I said. So, so with that as background, uh, I think it's more interesting to, to, to talk about what my plan is to, to look at going forward. Um, which is looking at if we can swap out the, the back end, the GPU rendering, to something more modern uh, that, from my perspective, hopefully will be faster. That's my, my main perspective. But after talking to, to Elias, I realized that there are other factors that are, um, that are even more important. So as an um, inspiration for this work uh, is the... Um, is the work done by by Roth in the um, in the Rust community, and I think there's been some links about this in the Slack channel as well. I find his results in this link. I won't go through them in detail now. Very exciting, uh, the performance performance he gets um, from it. So, so the hope is to be able to use his shaders, uh, probably with some modifications within you down the line to enable uh, compute-based um, vector rendering. I will, before going forward, I will just say, I haven't really worked that much with graphics, graphical code before. Uh, compute traders, not at all. So if anybody in the coming slides feel that I'm saying things that are incorrect, please do unmute your mic and uh, correct me and let's have a discussion. That's much better than me um, fooling everybody. 
So again, back to the re back to the requirements. If we were to swap out the rendering uh, backend, what's actually needed? And from from Elias's part, I think that the main uh, main goal here is to to look at less maintenance d down the line. Can we have an implementation that is the same across the platforms with just uh, small um, small uh, modifications to make it easy to maintain down uh, long term. Um, it's important to su support old devices, which is a challenge when it comes to compute shaders because only quite recent um, versions of OpenGL, Metal, uh, etc., DirectX uh, actually have support for compute shaders. And we'll get back to that. Uh, it should be easy to add new functionality. The GPU backend today, although it's performs re uh, reasonably well uh, and f from my perspective is is, is impressive uh, it's quite complex it's quite hard to add stuff and it's it's easy to break uh, things um, without intention so I think creating something that that makes it easy for us to add stuff like gradients whatnot down the line uh, is important and then again my interest in this is about better performance. Uh, the project I alluded to on the first slide that I initially wanted to use GU4 was to uh, write a small game uh, using only vector drawing, uh, no, no rasterization whatsoever. That's still my hope to get around to that someday, but we'll, we'll see how it, how it goes. So with that in mind, um, and chatting to Elias back and forth, the, the plan or the hope uh, for looking at the new backend is basically this seven stage uh, process um, where the first one is to ensure that we can run it on old devices meaning that we want or we have to be able to run the commute compute shader on the cpu and check if we get sufficient performance not for game obviously but hopefully for for simple uh, app interfaces some text etc uh, and really that's where i am i'm at, i still am at step one because it turns out, to my understanding, to be a lot harder to run compute shaders on the CPU uh, than one first would have thought. And I see that I'm running out of time, so I will run through the remaining slides really quickly. Uh, still a step one, yeah. So there's obviously a lot of uh, priority here. Uh, two examples is Swift Shader uh, and Web Render. Swift Shader is actually something that seems like we could have used uh, straight straight out uh, from a technological point of view. But there's two, um, two issues, licensing, big one, uh, um, which means that we can't actually include it in, in GU. Also the size, it's a big project and a big dependency to, to take on. Uh, Web Render is a Mozilla project to, to run uh, non-compute shaders on the CPU, meaning fixed pipeline shaders. But to my understanding, digging through that code, uh, they don't support compute shaders, which critically means that they don't support barrier calls, which, at least from my findings, it what is what makes it hard to to run the compute shaders well uh, on the um, on the CPU. Uh, so my work at the moment to to try is to uh, write a tool that takes a compute shader text file as input and gives you back a Go package ready to use to run that compute shader on the CPU, which in the background uses Cgo and a shared library that I generate with uh, CLang, um, because the compute shader GLSL code is quite similar to C++ code. So adding a runtime library around it, adding some libraries for sort of matrix operations and built-in functions, uh, in addition to some minor parsing changes to the code, makes it relatively simple to, to transform the compute shader into C++ code that we can compile with CLang, uh, generate the shared library, and wrap in Go. Uh, so the project, you can find it at, at uh, GitHub. Uh, please have a look and, uh, and, and give feedback, in particular uh, related to the, uh, the, the Go uh, API I'm exposing. Um, that would be highly appreciated. So a short example of, uh, of this running. 
did you can you see my second screen now when I swapped or are you still seeing the presentation? I saw the second screen. All right, cool. So as an example where, where I'm at the moment is this example of comp is a example Vulkan computer uh, code uh, defines some I won't run 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 through it in detail unless you're um, well versed in them but uh, basically defines a main function uh, that in this example calculates the center of gravity of a couple of polygons, which in turn are made up of triangles, uh, uses a barrier call to synchronize between different invocations such that only one of the invocation actually sums up the the, the total COG and, uh, and area of, uh, of all of the different polygons. Uh, so I should be able to just run my tool on this computer. It will take a couple of seconds because uh, I'm running um, C line at maximum optimization. And that creates for me then a Go package, kernel.go, a shared library, and a C Go wrapper package that um, allows me to call the C library. Uh, exposing something to Go that basically allows me to create a new computational kernel based on. On the shader code, and then dispatch. Uh, that's the um, compute shader language terminology. Dispatch uh, calls to this compute shader, and get the result back whilst mapping mapping uh, structures and data from Go world to um, to C world to ensure that the alignments and everything uh, match up. Uh, quite a lot of small small details there. So. Is should I should I wrap up in in one minute or do I have five minutes, Elias? Just take uh, five minutes. That's uh, right. Cool. That's so so the challenge I'm currently facing, uh, where I would definitely appreciate input if anyone is is more uh, knowledgeable about this than I am, is is this barrier call and how to implement that efficiently on the CPU. Uh, on the GPU, uh, typically you have maybe a couple of hundreds. Uh, invocations in this example is only eight, but 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 typically will be more uh, running uh, in parallel, and when they issue a barrier call, uh, that's like a uh, p-thread barrier, meaning that all of the invocations have to reach this barrier and wait until all of the other ones uh, have reached it. Then they can move on as a synchronization primitive, and that turns out to be really expensive on the CPU. Uh, the naive first approach is obviously obviously to to launch one OS thread for each invocation, but with hundreds of them and going through the barrier call, I get performance that is um, abysmal. So that's basically uh, unusable that that implementation uh, if we want to use it for rendering. So what I do now uh, that still I think is not good enough is that I. I basically spread out the CPU or the, the kernel invocations on a couple of OS threads. Uh, so let's let's look at the first OS thread only. He starts off by running one invocation until he reaches a barrier call, at which point he calls a assembly routine that basically is like a coroutine switch. It, it stores the current uh, well based on the ABI you're using, it stores the registers that needs to be stored. It stores a stack pointer and switches the running context in this thread without doing any system call to the next invocation. And it does that sequentially for all the invocations that have been allocated to that OS thread. Uh, but at some point, um, it will need to synchronize with uh, the other OS threads running the other invocation. So if we have, for example, 100 invocation, we might do, if you have two CPUs, we do 50-50. We do 50 on one OS thread and 50 on the other, meaning that they need to synchronize. This way we drastically reduce the number of um, system calls and, uh, and um, uh, synchronizations between threads. Um, still, this turns out, and this is, close to my last slide, still it turns out that the performance is not as good as I would have hoped. Let's have a look at the right-hand column first, which is for an extremely uh, numeric heavy kernel, basically doing uh, sine, cosine, tan of a thousand floats uh, in each 
kernel invocation, uh, where the first the top four ones are uh, results from go test when the benchmark function calls uh, the the wrap go package, and the bottom ones are just a reference um, go implementation of the same loop, just to get a, a sense of the speed we're getting. It should be noted here that Go is doing 64-bit calculations, not uh, not ROM access, just the calculation due to, to math.sign being 64-bit, uh, whereas uh, Clang obviously can use the 32-bit one. But here, anyway, here we see that the scaling of the um, of this approach is actually rather good. We get sort of twice the performance uh, using one thread, and we get twice the performing using eight threads. So that that looks good. But this kernel have no barrier calls, no scheduling whatsoever, or synchronization whatsoever. Whereas if we look at a, a kernel that is more, I think, representative of what we might end up using uh, in rendering code, I can't promise for sure, but it's my attempt to write something that is representative, uh, we see that the approach I'm using still gives me very, very um, varied performance, uh, whereas the the Go version is, is obviously uh, not. It should also be noted that actually the Go, the Go implementation here, or the reference implementation, does a lot less synchronization because it's not needed when you can write on the CPU, whereas it is on the GPU. But anyway, uh, since the performance on a sing single thread is four times as good when we use the wrapped kernel, I would have hoped that uh, the, the scaling to multiple processes uh, is better. We're running out of time. This is very much a working process, uh, but as I said, feedback is very welcome. I currently am a, at a bit of a loss on uh, which way to, to move forward, uh, what avenues to test. Uh, my current plan is to finish this off and then get to the stage where I can actually run the full uh, full GPU code from, uh, from RAF, from his uh, library, just to ensure that I have support for all we need in this uh, translation or translation package. Uh, and then, then, then we'll see how much time I have to, to move on to step two, three, four, and five, et cetera, on the, on the list. But, uh, but that's, that's the current state on, on GPU backend update. Thank you very much. That was, uh, that was very awesome. Um, a bit quick, maybe, but uh, it is what it is, yeah. Yes, it is what it is. I have a few questions. Um, you said that the, 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 in the old renderer, the um, the affine transformations were not cached. I believe that you mean that when if you animate the transformation, then it is not cached, right? Yes, that, that so is correct. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So if you have yeah. a static rotation, something that is always so rotated, say forty-five degrees, yes, then it will be cached just as and, and just as quick as just an offset, right? True. True. Good. So uh, I just want to say that uh, you you make it you try and make it sound that i have done much uh, some of the work of the, of this uh, which is completely untrue you have done all the work i've simply uh, looked through the code and uh, made some suggestions and in fact your current path uh, down the compute rendering was me roping you in uh, after you just uh, you asked me whether uh, something else could be done with the current renderer so um, i feel a little bit bad about that but on the other hand you've you've done some amazing work with this and i can't wait to see what uh, the end result would be uh, and i also want to mention that you managed to convince raf um, to open source to, to uh, release his shaders so the meat of the work of, of his new way of, of of drawing vector graphics with compute shaders you convinced him to uh, release that those shaders under the unlicensed so that is so that it's possible to just take his shaders verbatim and and use them directly into you so yeah, and, and that's, that's, that's a good and important point, and I think that that will be very important uh, down the line, because I think he's, he's very well, obviously, versed and knowledgeable, knowledgeable about that, and I think it would be very wasteful if we had to, to redo all of that work and, and keep it up to date uh, all the time, so yeah. Uh, and a short mention, I also want to do a vector graphics game at some point, that was also one of my... I'm I'm from a game development indie uh, back from background, so I have sort of this uh, this uh, this want to do uh, something with very simple graphics, but still everything back to graphics and so on. So that's that was pretty cool. Um, what do I have this? Oh, one question: this the the Seagull 
generated shared library. Is it possible to do a static library as well? Yes, I think. Again, <laughs> if anybody is is good at this, I would appreciate. I actually started off with a static library, uh, but then Clang was giving me problems when I moved because I have it implemented currently on Linux, OS X, and Windows uh, for uh, uh, x64 because. For each platform and architecture, you, you need a, a assembly wrapper to do the routine, yeah. routine switching, right? And on Windows, I was getting problems to generate the static libraries and linking, etc. So I just did shared libraries to make it easy. But I'm sure someone who knows Ceiling inside and out should be able to, to fix that. So there's no fundamental reason it, it, they could not be Not to my knowledge. Not that. to my knowledge. Thank you. So anyone else? That was all I had. I'm I'm real sorry that you're the one that ran out of time. That was awesome, and I wish you'd gone first. <laughs> thanks, thanks. Nice. We have we, we have other geo community calls. We'll definitely pull you guys in uh, for a second round. Um, so, yeah, I posted so a batch of answers to chat questions. Um, also. So anyone have questions for Chris? I don't know if the origin of Geo's name is just that it it is go with an extra letter, but that's why Neotify has that convention. It's, it's the word notify with the same extra letter in the same place. My, my original intention was something um, Along the lines of graphical input output, because that mm. was that was the view, the lens I I watched. I, I sort of considered the user interface, the, the graphical user interface problem. It's it mm -hmm. was simply a, a set of output operations for drawing and and somehow some way to um, to multiplex input between the interested uh, widgets. That makes sense. So Anthony, you had a question for Chris, right? Yes, I did, and Chris did uh, answer it in the chat. So, okay. um, well, so the, so, so the question was, why not, since it's tree-based, but since Arbor is tree-based, why not actually show it graphically as a tree? Um, I mean, I'd love to. <laughs> and, and you're right that we could. Um, the, the single biggest obstacle is if you do a conventional like computer science tree graph, where it yeah. spreads downward and outward, uh, there's this nightmarish UX problem where you're you're on some branch down here and your screen has a you know it's a finite size, sure. so there's stuff like above you and to the sides of you, and when new messages come in, how do you find them? Yeah, like, how do we indicate? Hey, there's there's something new, but it's diagonally up and to the left. Right, and then how do we make like getting to it not painful and and problems like that. Uh, I think might be tractable, but they're very complicated. Sure. Uh, so we're trying to build a, a more conventional interface first. Okay. But I definitely hope to do that. I, I've got some ideas, and maybe I can sketch them out, and we can share them later. I would love to talk about that, yeah. OK, cool. Thanks. Anyone else? Paul, you had a question for Chris about the scaling. Did you, did you mean um, the decentralized uh, approach yes. for chat would introduce scaling limitations? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it's not directly related to this call, hence can be taken off offline. Well, I'm happy to talk about it if, if you'll want. But... Yeah, sure, I'm interested. Okay. So uh, you're totally right. Um, and when you compare what we're doing in Arbor with, say, Slack, um, you know, Slack has uh, everything is just JSON. They're, they're sending a bunch of JSON blobs between servers over WebSockets. Um, and the cost of deserializing JSON is, is much lower than the cost of uh, hashing and validating a signature every time you receive a message. So like there, there's definitely like more CPU uh, 
being used per message in Arbor, I think. Um, but we do have some cool stuff uh, that that Slack doesn't in that the, the data structure we're manipulating in Arbor uh, can tolerate partitions. It doesn't need a primary copy that uh, is blessed. So you don't need a centralized database that must be in sync in order for updates to occur. Um, the, the Merkle tree structure means that you could have two relays running the same community with like a copy of the same conversation, and then they could lose touch with each other. And you could continue to write to both of them, adding new nodes. And admittedly, like the users on each side of that wouldn't see the other side immediately. But later on, you can recombine those trees without any collision um, because you don't control the identifiers of the nodes. Uh, and so we can, do, we can do some interesting stuff with having multiple relays that federate with one another and form spanning trees where necessary um, to distribute some of that cost. Uh, and honestly, the, the scaling limitations of parts of it are, are totally unknown. Like Arbor is not big or widely used right now. And, uh, I, I don't know how to assess some of that until we can, can actually generate some of that load. But if you have thoughts about how we ought to be approaching things uh, from that angle, I'd love to talk about it. Right, so any more questions? One, actually, uh, I find it very interesting as well. Um, um, so, so the notification you, you give the user at the first stage, uh, data is public, et cetera, can't be changed. If, if you're gearing towards a development community, we do from time to time see even in the Go project, for example, that they rewrite the history because they've leaked, leaked secrets or introduce stuff that's not needed, et cetera. Is there any plan for, for how to solve that, right? Uh, because I yes. think that will be needed at some point. Yes, absolutely. Um, our data structure can't not be immutable. Uh, we lose a whole bunch of the cool properties once it becomes mutable, but we can control two things. We can control what we store in it, and we can control um, the behaviors of certain pieces of infrastructure. So there's kind of three answers to your question. Uh, the first one is that we're going to have soft edits where you can reply to a node with essentially a patch that will change its display content, but not its in tree content. You can't change its in tree content without invalidating the signature and everything. Um, and so that is how you solve like typos and stuff. But for something serious, like I've leaked a secret, um, we're going to, and, and this is an important thing that is not yet implemented, but we're going to implement moderation policies uh, where the people who run the infrastructure uh, and and other delegates of theirs will be authorized uh, to say this message needs to be uh, or like the relay should not propagate messages marked or flagged for sensitive content um, and that would be like another mechanism uh, where if you leak something important, someone with that power on the infrastructure you're using, uh, or you can request that someone with that power prevent the relay from propagating that node and other uh, chat participants who already have it may or may not choose to respect the request to destroy it. Like they, they already have a local copy and we can't right. actually force them to delete it. Um, the last thing is that we can create revocable messages that store the actual content of their message in another medium. It doesn't have to live in the Arbor chat nodes themselves. You know, we could instead store a URI to the content and just lock down a hash of whatever should be there. And then to delete a message, you can just make that URI 
stop resolving. Um, you lose some decentralizability uh, because now you have to like hit some other service over some other protocol to resolve the content of messages. But the trade-off is that now you can delete a message after you've sent it. Um, and so we haven't yet worked out how we want that to work. We'd like that mostly to be a transparent decision to the user um, and probably default to a mechanism like that that is kind of safer for people who I, I think users are going to expect that. Um, but users who are in a, in a scenario where they really want some of the privacy or decentralizability capabilities where I don't want to hit a third party server to resolve the content of a message, then you might be able to opt into like raw messages or, or whatever we'd call them where the, the content is embedded and uh, just live with the trade-off. Thanks. Makes sense. I'll I'll send you. I'll I'll have some questions for you offline, but not take everybody's time because I find I I am very interested in this. Yeah. Thanks. Oh, awesome. Great. If no one has uh, any further questions, let let's end this call for now, or at least the recording of it. We can always uh, hang around a few more minutes uh, to talk about whatever. I've just got a, a, a quick one. There's a new design draft for embedding data for Go. I don't know if you guys have seen that or not. Um, and, but I'm wondering if we could use that for embedding things like font data. I would say yes. Yeah. It's uh, immediately useful for embedding. That's that's the way that the current uh, Go fund packages and the Right, Robota font packages work. They have a generate script that takes exactly. the fonts and and generates Go code for it. So that would would be an obvious uh, improvement, not not directly for geo programs per se, because I suppose that the end result will still be you using the fonts indirectly. So um, if I I. Don't know if that was your question. Would it have any impact on Q programs? Was that the... no? I just uh, I originally had the the font question, but I was just wondering if there are any other uses. I would uh, yeah. It would put it make embedding of icons and and uh, images and and all those extra things that you need for a typical. Um, GUI programs easier. I would certainly use it for the tail scale client for the few icons and, and graphics and logos I have. Perfect. Okay. Thanks. Yes. So Victor, you asked about the validation of uh, the Arbor chat tree. Yeah, but I, I can I can ask Chris offline unless you guys are interested. Uh, I it was just on 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 his second point that you could choose not to distribute messages, and then I was just wondering, would that not mean then that later clients would not be able to verify the Merkle tree if they're not getting access to the data that actually built the hashes? But, I, but, I believe the Merkle tree only contains the hashes for for validation. Is not correct, Chris? Uh, not quite. Um, the Merkle tree contains the the bulk of everything um so if if you moderated a node such that it was no longer distributable it would invalidate everything in the tree underneath it like it, it would become impossible for someone who didn't already have a copy of that to reach any content in that subtree um and that that is part of the price. I mean, I think a reasonable assumption is that for most use cases of moderation, it would be acceptable to discard all responses to the moderated content. You know, if it's an accidentally leaked password, most of the responses are probably going to be, hey, this is, what, what was this? You probably want to get rid of point, this. Yeah, yeah, fair point, yeah. Um, but I'm, 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 I haven't used Merkle tree much, but I, as far as I remember, it, the Merkle tree 
nodes only contain hashes. Isn't that correct? So I have encountered this like bizarre, um, bizarre phenomenon. Uh, I think the Merkle tree vocabulary is used for two different data structures, and I don't know what to call the difference. There's there's an there's an upward tree where you have a bunch of data in leaf nodes and you hash them and you take those hashes and you form new nodes and you hash them and you take those hashes and you're you're building upward to a single hash that effectively summarizes the entire tree. But there's a different way to construct a tree where you have a node with some data and then you create a child node and the child node has as its like parent the hash of that first node. So each node is data bearing and refers to uh, the parent node by its hash. And so uh, this is a lot closer to Git's Merkle DAG, but it's not a directed acyclic graph. It's still a forest because we don't allow multi-parent. Yeah, but still, if you have this DAG or whatever structure you have, the, the hashes that depends on uh, parent hashes and so on, they only depend on the hashes, hash values. Yeah, yeah but the point is, if you, if you want to verify it, you need to hash the data to ensure that the hashes match, right? Because otherwise, someone could modify the history. Yeah, not quite. Not if you, you, ha you need the message to verify the message of that node. But you can still, I would say, verify the relationship between the messages with only the hashes. So the it would be true that if you got a disconnected subtree where like the message that connected it to a larger tree was missing because for instance it had been somehow prevented from reaching you by moderation, um, you would be able to internally validate it. Mm -hmm. um, but without that intermediate node, um, you wouldn't be able to validate with total certainty that it was a response to that particular intermediate node's contents. And you wouldn't be able to tell from the hash of that intermediate node which message within the larger conversation it was a response to. You would be able to tell where within, well, you'd be able to identify the conversation and community in which the subtree occurred but you wouldn't be able to link it to like its grandparent message oh, oh, so without that, its parent. Yeah, but th that sounds to me like you're hashing the metadata, the, the node position along with the message itself, right? Yes. OK, so you could, in theory, split the message out and say what you're hashing is the message hash and the metadata. Yes. And then you could throw away the messages. And so the users will see yeah, this so node that's... doesn't have any messages. Uh, this okay. node yeah. is, is um, missing its message. But otherwise, it would be not be, uh, uh, there would not be a problem deleting the messages from the servers. You're right. And that's, that's kind of what I was talking about with the third approach, where we, okay. we take message content and we, we make it severable from the metadata. Um, and I think. You're right that we could make it severable by just like distributing it as a as a metadata list blob referred to by hash that we can redact as needed, um, and that's a that's a good way to do it in band within like the Arbor ecosystem. But we could also, uh, if you want to have a more centralized control over that data, instead of hosting it as just some binary blob, we can host it as a, a URL somewhere. Mm -hmm. on a central web server where an admin can say delete and then at 404s and now you can't retrieve it. But yeah, you're you're right that that we can build it that way. And um maybe that's the way we should build it. The data structure is versioned, so it's not hard to roll out changes like that. So Victor, I have a question about the compute stuff if you have the time still. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Um so I was thinking isn't there is there a way for uh, to to use the simd operations of the cpu so that you can in fact run say is it four times 
uh, four kernels at a time per core. Right. So <laughs> I don't want to say no because I'm sure someone can prove me wrong. But but my understanding is is no. Uh, basically, that's what they do in Web Render. Uh, but I I fail to understand how we can do that with arbitrary branches in a good way. So, for example, if I have a compute shader that calls different uh, functions, sub functions depending on my index in the list, mm -hmm. then that code will branch out in two separate paths. And, and on the on, on the that, GPU yeah. on the GPU on the hardware side, and they then they stall some of the invocations and mm -hmm. they run them sequentially. But I, I just see implementing support for understanding and parsing when we need to split and how to merge back and how to move everything back aligned and get there. I, I, to me, it just sounds like a lot of work. So I'm, I've, I've been afraid to even think about that approach, yeah. uh, but basically. So, so what I do now is I rely on CLang instead to vectorize stuff internally in the kernel instead, right? So I rely on him to, to auto unroll loops and vectorize loops that run hope that that gives us enough performance because I think going down the line of d doing what you're suggesting, to me, uh, it will be big work, basically. <laughs> I think that that's what I'm saying. Okay. But if you have an other understanding or an idea of how it would be done, please, uh, please share it. <laughs> No, I'm, 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 I'm sure that's that's pretty much the gist of it. That is, it may be possible, uh, but it's, but it's definitely a lot of work if if no one else has has been doing that before. But you say that web render is doing something similar, um, and also as when you say this, you, the thing you say that when when branches go in in separate directions, that's what you you have a term for that on the GPU side as well. It's called what is it, diversification, diversification, um, decoherence, or something like that. So I believe that is that is an issue on the GPUs as well. It, it definitely is. Yeah. It definitely is an issue on the GPUs uh, as well. Uh, so I'm sure it's possible to solve. I haven't looked into web render mm -hmm. really detailed since we couldn't use it anyway due to licensing. So I can't use any of their code. Anyway, in my work, if I could have done that, <laughs> my work would have been a lot smaller. Uh, so, so I, uh, but but yes, they do vectorize. But I think I'm not sure, so don't quote me on this. But I think that means that they limit what type of kernels they actually reasonably support. Mm -hmm. uh, and my feeling is that they get away with that because they mostly run fixed pipeline stuff, which mm -hmm. is about uh, doing the same vector operations on. On nodes and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, whereas we will likely, when I at least when I browse uh, Ralph's code, it looks like a lot more complex code than than just uh, traditional peer rendering code. But but again, don't quote me on this. I don't know for sure. That was just my feeling looking at it, and that's why I took this approach. Can web render offline compile uh, your shaders? Uh, yes, web render offline compiles, but not so that, compute, but not compute shaders. Okay, so that that's uh, that was just uh, as a reference to your license question. So if the tool is is separate, no, the tool, yeah, but but part of what we include is several thousand lines of C plus plus header files to um, to implement all okay. built in GLSL functions and vector okay. operations, metric operations, etc. Et and that's what I've had to read down now because I can't reuse their okay. implementation, right? Okay. Because to my understanding, that means that we would be including bad or licenses we don't want. Yeah. Thank you. Let's uh, round this off. Thank you very much, Paul, for hosting this uh, call. And see you next time. <laughs>